I'm Bianca Cotton, host of Behind the Confidence Smile, where we inspire women to walk in love, live in hope, and be healed from past hurts. And today, I am blessed to be with Lakeisha Spike, special guest, telling us about her journey of being a teen mom. Welcome. <laughs> I am so, so excited and grateful to be sitting here with you and am just encouraged by learning about your journey of being a teen mom and where you are today. And was like, we must have you share this with the world. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here and share my story. Yes. So we're going to take we going to go back a couple of decades um, to when you were a small girl. You know, some girls play with dolls and Barbie houses or draw pictures of families. When you think about your childhood, did you dream of having a family one day? I did. I think I kind of dreamed of having like the white picket fence, mm. you know, the storyline, the fairy tale storyline that a lot of people kind of create in their mind. And so I did want to be a mom. I spent a lot of time uh, with my parents watching the Cosby's growing up. <laughs> and so I had, you know, some different things even from there that I liked the lessons that they did. So, yeah, I really used to dream of being a mom and some things that I wanted to teach my kids and how I wanted my house to be and run. And, yeah. mm, I like the Cosby's too. <laughs> so when you thought about what you wanted to teach your children, what was one of the things that you wanted them to learn? Some of the things I want them to learn, first of all, I always used to tell them this even when I had kids, but I used to want, I want them to be productive. Mm -hmm. I wanted them to be um, assets to the world, right? I wanted them to be able to carry their own weight, but also help others to carry theirs. Mm -hmm. And so uh, watching the Cosby show, when I used to see how they would, you know, try to teach their kids lessons, I realized, not by me, I know it was God that showed me this, but I realized that those lessons, even with Theo, all the lessons he had to learn, weren't just for him. Right. You know, he influenced his friends. And so mm -hmm. I really wanted my kids to have a good foundation and understand life and what it really um, entailed. Yeah, not That's just the fun part. Fun part is good too, but true, yeah. True. So as we approach your teenage years, um, prior, prior to you becoming a teen mom, were you dating or just like focused on studies? Like bring us into your world as a teenager. Wow, so it was a little of both. Okay. I was kind of focused on my studies, but dating seemed to be the thing to be doing. <laughs> so it's like, well, I need to be dating. So who am I dating? And so, yeah, but I was focused on my studies and dating. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so now you focus on your studies and dating and you are 16. Or did you get pregnant at 15? I got pregnant at 15. You got pregnant at 15, mm -hmm. gave birth at 16. Mm -hmm. When you were 15 and you found out you were pregnant, what, right? Like you just made the facial expression. <laughs> what was that moment like? <clears throat> Wow. So it was actually, I knew exactly when I got pregnant because I had never had sexual intercourse before. And so it was actually like two months shy of my 16th birthday. Mm. And so um, I remember even like contemplating doing the act before that, how my, my, my spirit was conflicted. Like, mm. no, you're not. And I'm like, yes, I am. <laughs> no, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. And so once I found out, it's like, I knew I was pregnant immediately, mm. like busted, like busted, <laughs> you pregnant. And so I felt like even once I came home, my mom was like, like she knew so I was different. Mm. I left the house one way <laughs> and I came home back home and I was different. Wow. And it was evident in my statute and who I was. And um, not shortly after that, maybe even a week after that, my mom was like, are you pregnant? Hmm. I was like, I don't know. And she was like, what do you mean? You don't know? <laughs> and I said, I mean, I don't know. No. <laughs> She's like, where well, are you, the Virgin Mary? Um. And I was like, I don't even know what that means. Right. But uh, no, I don't know. I don't know who that is. I had no clue what that meant at the time. Mm -hmm. And so um, I remember my mom running out and getting a test mm. and having me to urinate in a cup. 
and she went in the bathroom, her to test, and my bodily fluids. Yeah. And she was in there a long time. Mm. And I looked at my little sister. I'm like, should I leave? Probably not. Because <laughs> she was in there a long time. A long time. Mm. And so she came out. She didn't really say much, but I could tell. Mm. She's like, okay, so we need to have some conversations and get some doctor's appointments and things like that. But I just felt the, the like, wow, this is heavy. Mm-hmm. Especially when she was in the bathroom that long. I was like, this is heavy. This is real stuff. Why did you think that you needed to leave because she was in there so long? Like, what was going through your mind? Right. I'm like, I don't know, you know, where do I go from here? Mm. Am I now a grown up and I need to, like, get out and get on my own? Like, what does oh, this look like? What does that mean? Yeah. So, yeah. Mm. Speaking of that, like, do I need to go out and get my own? What year were you in high school? Were you a freshman, a, sophomore, junior? I was a sophomore. I was okay. a sophomore. Yeah. Because when I gave birth, I was a junior. But I was a sophomore when I found out I was pregnant. Mm-hmm. So you're a sophomore, a couple of months shy of your 16th birthday. Your mother asks you, are you pregnant? you like, hmm. Like, how, first of all, how, does she sniff it? Like... How does she... I told you I was different. Right. When I came back, I was different. And, like, the whole day, we were still visiting families because it was about Christmas time. So we mm. were visiting family. And when I came back, she just kept looking at me, kept looking at me. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Didn't really the say anything. Intuition. Yeah, didn't really say much. And then our interactions for the next couple of days were kind of interesting. And then that's when she found out, like, are you pregnant? Mm. And I was like, I, I don't know. Interesting. And she had never asked me that question before. Right. So at what point did you tell the father? Oh, as soon as she was in the bathroom. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, as soon as she was in the bathroom. I'm Mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah. And how did he respond? He was shocked. Now, he was a freshman in college. Oh. Yeah, so he had just, he was, that was his first semester away, too. So he hadn't even finished really, well, he had just finished his first semester of college. So... Yeah. What? So this takes another turn, <laughs> right? You you find out you pregnant, boyfriend, first semester, completion in college. How far away was he? Like an hour away, two hours? Brace yourself. <laughs> he was in Champaign. Ah, so not far from Chicago. Mm-hmm. And he is shocked. So did he continue on with school? He did. He okay. did. He continued on with school. We had like a family meeting with mm. he, my mom, and uh, just he, myself, and my mom. So just okay. the three of us. Um, and we had this conver- conversations about different options. Mm. Um, abortion came up. Um, and I was just, when they said, when they when that even came to the table, I don't even remember who suggested it. It's just like everything stopped. Like I stopped hearing. Like I was no longer even in that room. When that mm. conversation started about abortions, I was like, mm. Mm. I just didn't even listen anymore. Yeah. What made you shut down when abortion came up? I think, um, as I said before, thinking when I was younger, being a mom, it's like I thought of that as a child. I didn't think of it in this manner or happening this way, but here it is. And do I throw it away? Mm. So I just stopped listening. What a courageous choice to make at a, as a now, you know, at that time, 16 year old, probably by this time. It went further than that, though. <clears throat> it was almost like um, a voting took place. Oh, wow. And I lost. Explain. <laughs> the, the <voting. laughs> so this conversation, this topic came up about abortion. Mm hmm. It's like we took a round robin. Okay. And I was outnumbered. Oh, they voted. Oh, yeah. To, yeah. For you to abort yes. the. Yes. Yes. Wow. But it gets even better. Okay. <laughs> a mom finds a place to go, makes the appointment. Mm. Still, I'm still not. Complying. I'm, I'm complying. Oh. But everything in me is like, mm mm. Mm. We go to the appointment. We go to the room. God is so good. 
And I remember he was supposed to meet us there. Mm. And we were on 95th and uh, Western and it was in a high rise and I could see, we could see Western from the street. Mm -hmm. from, so we're sitting in this room and um, looking, I could see him driving by trying to find us. I didn't have a cell phone at that time. Um, and I could see him driving by and we're sitting in the room waiting on the people to come in and talk to us. And so the lady came in, she said, before we start the procedure, I need you guys to watch this video. And she pressed play. Mm. And the video started. And the video was basically the process of what an abortion does, what it looks like, what it is, all of that. Oh, wow. Uh-huh. And the video played, I think the video may have been 15 minutes. We watched three of it. And my mom looked at me and was like, let's go. She changed her mind. Changed her vote. Mm. Did you ever ask her why she changed her vote? Well, once we got in the car a little bit, it was mostly like her reflecting, I think, and I just happened to be in the car. And she's like, what? What was that? You know, she was kind of having this conversation with herself. And I was just kind of sitting there like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Under my mind, under my breath. But I think seeing that and knowing what it is and people talking about it versus you seeing, like it was a video mm. of someone actually going through the procedure. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So she was kind of a process in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm, what a time. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens next? Your mom like, okay, let's go. So let's we go. get in the car. We stop at McDonald's or somewhere, <laughs> grab us some food. I'm almost sure it's McDonald's because I love fish filet. She bought me a fish filet. We got home and I went to sleep. Mm. So I wake up I'm, and I fell asleep on, in the living room on the couch watching TV. So I kind of just fell asleep, you know, not even all the way laying down, just kind of my head to the side. And I remember waking up and my boyfriend was sitting next to me. So he must have come while I was asleep. He's still thinking everything happened. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so he like, how was it? How you doing? Right, because he kept, he was driving past the company. Yeah, right, right. So he's thinking that, mm. yeah. And I'm like, huh? You know, because, yeah. So it took me a minute to catch up with where he was because he was still far behind. <laughs> This gets better and better. <laughs> now, when you told him the abortion didn't happen, what was his reaction? He was like shocked. Like, oh, well, oh, my. Because I, at the time, looking back, he had not told anybody. Mm. Not even his parents? No. Oh, mm -mm. wow. He hadn't told anybody. And so I think his reality has shifted a lot. Definitely. And so he was like, okay, okay. So he just sitting there, you know, kind of processing. Um, we probably even watched the Cosby's, I don't know. And then towards the end of the day, he left, went home, and I um, went to bed. And then the next day we talked again. It's like, okay, well, where do we go from here? And we kind of start making different plans to become parents. Mm -hmm. uh, his parents still didn't know. So as we continue to have conversations, um, like, well, when are you going to tell them? Now, I'm going to these people's house. Right. They see me. They see I'm changing. Right. <laughs> so it's not like I had never met his family. Right. They didn't know me. No, I'm going to their house. And I remember one day we were doing something in their backyard because I had my daughter in September. Mm -hmm. And so this is the, in the summer, maybe like May-ish. He still hadn't told them. Oh, wow. You, oh, you're showing that? I'm at their house. I'm at their house all the time. And so um, mm. his grandmother at the time, we were all in the backyard there barbecuing. His grandmother had the only seat that was out there. Everybody else was kind of sitting on the steps and stuff, just like old school barbecue. And I remember his grandmother insisting that I take her seat. And she's like 80 years old. After he took me home, I'm like, you need to tell them. Like, because grandma knows. <laughs> Grandma gave me her seat. She didn't say nothing. Insisted. Not but, gave me. I, like, sit down. Sit down. <laughs> you, right here. Hi, I'm Darius Hillman. Joining me on the winter season premiere of In the Arena, rapper, songwriter, producer, and now television host, Rich Robbins. I think we have these very confined stories in our head and confined boundaries in our head of what black fathers can do and what they are and how they're able to love and I want to show them that it's actually limitless. 
Step in the arena Tuesday, January 16th at 7 p.m. on Can TV Cable Channel 19 or stream at CanTV.org or on the Can TV Plus app. Experience the power of community television. So September rolls around. Well, oh. August rolls around oh. first, and he goes back to school. Right. And I'm like, this is maybe a good time for you to tell him. I don't know. Write them a letter. <laughs> send a bird note. That you're I don't about know. to have a grandchild. So he did that. He wrote them a letter. Mm. They didn't contact him after they read the letter. They showed up in my house where his mom did. And his mom was a school counselor. Oh. And so as soon as she got the note, she like came to my house, like ring the bell. And my mom didn't know that they didn't know. Because <laughs> our parents really never really met met. So oh. she just thought that they were doing their thing and she's doing her thing. She didn't really. So his mom came in. His mom apologized. His mom. Yeah. And then his mom just started dropping off stuff every day. Wow. Every day. Every day. She worked near Sears. Mm -hmm. On 79th Street. Mm -hmm. And she would stop there every day. And she would bring baby stuff. So I had so much stuff every day. She would bring diapers. She would bring ones. And she would bring every day. Every day. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> how, did, how did you feel knowing that he couldn't or wouldn't, like, tell his parents and he's going back to cop? You know, back and forth. What was that like for you? carrying his child. I understood because his family structure had a certain amount of stature. Oh. And so I understood, and he was the youngest. And so he has his older brother who's doing well, who had graduated from college, who had a master's degree working in banking, and they were really close. Um, and I don't even think he knew. Mm. Probably He probably knew right before the letter was sent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I understood that there was like, you know, this statue that the prince has messed up type of thing. That pressure. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. The pressure to be perfect. Mm-hmm. Ah, oh, man. Perfection be messing up stuff, don't it? Yeah. Yeah. And so August, now she dropping off stuff. Uh, did you ever hear from the father or did you just see the, mo the mom a lot? Um. The father, I would see him only when I would go over there. Okay. He, he never contacted me um, during that time, um, but I would see him when I go over there. And he was um, he was always really nice to me. Um, but I think that he thought um, that I would go away because I wasn't the first girlfriend. Um, so I think he thought that I would go away. And then I think that he thought that I was trapping the prince. Um, what yeah. made you think that he thought that? Because he said it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and how did that feel to receive that information? I was like, from no, him? sir. Oh, he and I had a wonderful relationship. He was very <laughs> blunt, and so was I. And he was like, oh, you done found a feisty one. Yeah. So, wow. yeah. <sighs> That's a lot to digest. At 16 years old, your whole world shifts smack dead in the middle of your high school years. So, do you. After giving birth, do you continue on with um, high school? Did you choose to, you know how they have alternative schools? Well, I don't know at that time if there was uh, daycares in schools. I know that's more maybe more of a recent thing, but what was your life like now, I think, entering junior year of high school with the baby? So junior year, I went back to school before I even had the baby. And, um, you know, there was a lot of girl drama, mean girl drama. Actually, he used to date a girl that went there. It was a whole bunch of stuff. And I wasn't uh, one to back down from stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so I almost got in several altercations. Oh, wow. And I had had some physical fights before I was pregnant. So they knew I didn't shy away from that. And I played basketball. I was on the basketball team. And so my coach, um, I wasn't playing anymore because I couldn't, but my coach had come up to me one day in the hallway when I was engaging in an altercation. He's like, you can't stay here. He's like, for your safety and the safety of your child, I need you to uh, consider this alternative school. So mm -hmm. I ended up going to an alternative school called Arts of Living. It was in downtown Chicago. Okay. And then I delivered my daughter when I was there. 
And so continued my studies there. My boyfriend and I were still dating. We had a really good relationship where we would have different type of competitions, like who can get the best grades. And we would have, so, you know, I remember I got a 4.0 and he bought me this wonderful white leather coat and it was just cute. But we had competitions going on to still be good uh, students, to still be good parents and things like that. And so um, I went to Arts of Living. But at the time, that school that I went to, there were some schools that had daycares. There was another school called Tesla. Um, and that was the school his mom thought I went to at first because she had offered to take me to school because she worked right there. And I was like, that's not the one I go to. It's downtown. <laughs> 720 North LaSalle. Mm. Um, but they didn't have one at my location. They didn't have a daycare. So that was a whole nother thing, trying to look for child care and all those things. So, yeah. And at one point, his dad started watching her for me because uh, he had retired. He was a retired school principal. Wow. And so he uh, started to watch her for me. Um, but that was later on once I was in college and things like that. But daycare was a whole struggle. A neighbor ended up watching her for a little while for me while I finished school. Um, the good thing after I delivered, though, um, I was on homebound for a while. So mm -hmm. I was able to still have school and have my baby there with me, which was good. All of my grades were good. And like even the teachers would come to my house and people would look at me like, you are not the typical teen mom. Like you're mm -hmm. doing your work. I come here, you got it already. It was just, a, it was a different experience for me. And to have his mom bringing things, that was to me was like, okay, you've done this thing, but we're going to assist you. Here are the resources. So I didn't feel like I had to leave like I did in the beginning. Right. Yeah, so it felt like that that myth or that feeling that I had was being dismantled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that you brought shame mm -hmm. on the family. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. How was your mom after you gave birth? I think to see me still doing all the things, she was fine. She was fine. She appeared to be fine. I mean, right. we have to bring her <laughs> and ask her, but she appeared to be fine. Uh, I was still doing all the things. Then I started college, and uh, my sister laughed and used to say my daughter was our baby, like the family mm -hmm. baby, because I would go to school. Sometimes she would go with me. I would take her to class with me, but a lot of times they're like, no, she can stay. And so my sister would have her... Um, and watch her and take her places and do things like that. So, yeah. What would you say was your greatest challenge becoming a team mom? The, the greatest one was um, getting stable childcare at the beginning. That was mm -hmm. really, really hard. And I was like, do I drop out of school? Um, Cause the neighbor was watching it, my daughter for a while, but that really wasn't working. And then they need to work too. The neighbor was my friend's sister and she had a baby, um, but he was like two. And so then I had my baby and she's like, I'll watch it. And she was like in her early twenties, but then she needs to go to work. Her baby needs to go to daycare. Mm -hmm. So I really didn't have a, a childcare provider anymore. And then I felt like I asked this one lady who was retired that was always nice. And um, she lived right next door to us, kind of, sort of. And I had went over and I asked her and she was like, no. And then she passed away like three weeks later. I was oh. like, oh. So I don't know what that was about. But that was like the most challenging thing, just really solidifying daycare. That was challenging. It took a long time before I was able to get really good daycare. Mm -hmm. And what was support? I know you talked about academic support with your boyfriend. Like you all would have competitions. But with him being away at school, what did that support look like? Um, most of the support was financial. Um, like I didn't have to worry about anything when it came to finances, which could be a struggle being a parent, period. Mm -hmm. And so most of it was financial. Um, he would, When he would come up, he would spend time with her, spend time with us. Um, but other than that, it was mostly financial because he was away. Mm -hmm. um, and we would still talk on the phone and things, but she was little. So she would talk a little once she got older. But, yeah, she didn't see him because he was at school. Mm -hmm. As we come to a close with our time together and wow, right? <laughs> what a journey um, at, from the age of 15. What would you say? What would you say to your 15-year-old self? What would you tell her? Wow. Whew. I would tell her probably so many things, but one of the things I definitely would tell her is to trust God. Like, really trust mm -hmm. God. Because there were times when doubt would try to come in, and for the most part, I would feel like, you got this. You can keep going. You can still achieve all your dreams. 
Mm. But when I look around, I didn't see that. Mm. So I would say trust God. And what would you what would you share with parents who may be experiencing what your mom experienced? Like, oh, my daughter is pregnant or my son um, is about to have his first child. What would you tell them? Be open to the experience. Have real conversations. Be open to learn from the See this as an opportunity. And I think overall, I think my mom saw it as an opportunity to assist me, an opportunity to watch me grow um, and just let the, the impossible be done. Because sometimes we put a cap on what's going to happen when that happens. Like you're not going to, you know, you're going to work in fast food forever or you're going to work, you know, you can't mm. achieve anything beyond, you know, this certain level because of this. And so just being open to the experience and, and providing wisdom. I think that would be something to say too, providing wisdom. Mm. Is there one resource you would share with teen parents that you think could be helpful for them? Yeah, um, I know Child Care Initiative was one because that was one that actually helps you to find providers to mm. care for your children and they will help to pay for it. Um, that was one of the ones that really helped me. Even like the alternative school, there are a plethora of resources that the alternative school gave to me um, that help even with providing transportation back and forth for school, the money for that. Um, they had a social worker there and usually they have a list of resources depending mm -hmm. on your need. Mm -hmm. And so some of the things I didn't need, but like if you needed a crib, you could get a crib. Mm -hmm. So just reaching out to like the alternative schools, child care initiative, uh, those type of programs. Oh, there was one program called PASS, P-A-S-S, -S, and you would go there and they kind of would give you some therapy too. Mm -hmm. And after you do your therapy session, they would give you coupons to go shop in their shop uh -huh. and they had different items in there too. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Thank you for all that you have shared um, during our time together. And I learned some new things <laughs> about you that I didn't know before, but definitely... You have turned beauty from what was looked at as ashes at the time. So, again, it's been a beautiful, beautiful conversation talking about a challenging journey yeah. that did not come easy. All right, you all. Share this episode, y'all. <laughs> and thank you for tuning in.